And now your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to a very special edition of It's a Miracle. The events of September 11th, 2001, will be forever seared into the memory of every American old enough to understand what happened that day. And what happened that day was the most reprehensible act of terrorism the world has ever known. But even in the most dire circumstances, miracles can and do happen. And 9-11 was no exception. We begin minutes before the first plane hits tower number one. On the morning of September 11, 2001, as thousands of people were showing up to work at the World Trade Center, most were strangers. But a group of men were about to forge a bond that would mean the difference between life and death. The late summer day began just like every other for mailroom clerk Alfred Smith. I went to the cafeteria to obtain my breakfast, as I always do. And I took the escalators back up to the next level, which is 44, to take the elevator to my floor. That morning, George Phoenix was heading for the same elevator. I worked in the engineering department for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the 74th floor, and stepped into the elevator. At the last moment, Jan Damczur, an immigrant from Poland, managed to squeeze into the elevator. At the time, the presence of this 10-year veteran of the Twin Towers window washing team seemed unimportant. But soon, all that would change. It was 10 to 8 when Michael Hinkson arrived at his office on the 78th floor, along with his seeing eye dog, Roselle. The two had been constant companions for nearly two years, and from the start, Roselle had been the perfect choice. She was a calm dog, undistracted by the hectic pace of New York City life. That morning, as Roselle assumed her usual position under his desk, Michael immediately went to work. The reason I happened to be in the office that day is that we were training some resellers. For some of these people, it was their first visit to the World Trade Center, yes. okay. and none of them, except Michael, actually worked in the building. The security is pretty tight for people entering the building, so we were creating a list for security. That's the most recent list that I got. But the list would never reach its final destination. I literally was turning to open a file drawer to get letterhead when the airplane struck the building. We thought it could have been an explosion, but it didn't seem like an explosion given the fact that the building began to sway over. So we thought something probably had struck the building. The elevator shook violently from side to side and dropped. Keep it button. Hit, hit all the buttons. Keep any buttons. We all just looked at each other and we didn't really know what was going on. Buttons. Keep any buttons. Hit the emergency button. Stop. The emergency brakes had stopped the elevator's rapid descent, at least for the moment. The question now was how to get help. Can anybody hear us out there? We're stuck in the elevator. It just dropped several floors. But no one was answering the intercom. Maybe we just can't hear them. They can hear us. We're stuck in the elevator. Nobody talked to us for a good two, three minutes, and finally somebody got on and said, there's been a, an explosion in the building. an explosion in a building this size? What kind of an explosion could this have been? What are we supposed to do? We need to get out of the elevator. We need some help. Nobody answered. We yelled, he's going to send somebody, rescue, and 
We don't hurt any more boys. Twenty-eight floors above, Michael Hinkson was organizing an orderly evacuation. I was the only person who would normally be in that office out of that group. We have to get our All right, we'll take them to the stairwell. The entrance is the first door to the left of the elevator. So I immediately felt responsible. With everyone safely accounted for, he turned his attention to Roselle. I know Roselle very well. She's not a dog that panics easily. On the other hand, the right circumstances could cause anyone to panic, and so I wanted to make sure that I had Roselle. Michael, we've got to go. We just power down this thing. There's no time. We've got to go. Come on. Sensing the urgency in his colleague's voice, Michael grabbed Roselle and followed David Frank into the hall. And immediately he knew that the situation was much worse than he'd imagined. Smoke? It smells like jet fuel. Just check it for heat. That's you can't mistake the smell of burning jet fuel. So we knew that there was a plane involved, but that's all we knew. There were people coming into the stairs. We were all nervous. We were all worried. We knew something had happened. Does anybody know what floor we are? All of a sudden, it starts, I smelled smoke. And I asked, anybody else smell smoke? And all of a sudden, everybody was like, yes, they smell smoke. And at that point, we were stuck, we had smoke coming in, and now there's nobody on the other side of this phone. When the plane struck tower number one at 8.45 a.m., its occupants were quickly plunged into disaster. But from the 84th floor of tower number two, Eurobank executive Brian Clark had an entirely different perspective on the situation. I heard this loud boom. I spun around and the airspace outside my office was nothing but a fireball. As a fire marshal on his floor, Brian was trained to take charge in an emergency. Come on, everybody! My first instinct was that there was an explosion in our building about two floors above me. You gotta get out of the building. Is everybody out? Right. And it wasn't an explosion. A plane actually crashed into Tower One. We just saw it on television. Move everybody out. Come on, let's go. Let's call these people out right now. Even though there appeared to be no immediate danger, Brian continued the evacuation. And then the strobe lights flashed, and there was an announcement. Your attention, please. Building two is secure. There is no need to when the announcement came, my thoughts were, somebody in authority knows what's going on. We can relax just a little bit. Let's go back to work. Let's go. Down in the lobby, Fuji Bank Assistant Vice President Stanley Premuth and a colleague had no intention of returning to their office. We are making our exit out and the security guard stopped us. Where are you going? Okay, we're gonna go to home now. Sir, sure, everything's no, fine. No. The building's secure, please no, go back to your office. And he said, no, go back to your office. Your building is safe and it's secured. It's okay to go back up. You go home and relax, okay, and I'll call you. It'll be fine. I turned to the young lady who was with me and I said, why don't you take the rest of the day off? And that was probably the wisest decision I ever made. Looks like everything's okay. Go back up. Come on, Sam, back to work. But the rest of the folks who were there with me, they were looking at me strange as if I made a wrong judgment call. And they're urging me, come on, come on, let's go. And I'm like, all right, I'm going. As Stanley returned to the 81st floor, back in Tower 1, Michael Hinkson continued his descent, relying on the instincts of his guide dog, Roselle. Roselle had to sense there was an emergency. She stayed focused on guiding. I did wonder, is fire going to be at the stairs? Is there fire that will catch up to us? I'm, I'm worried about those things. The men trapped in the elevator were facing a worse predicament. If we open the door, we can and with no hope of help arriving, they turned their attention to the doors and using brute force, pried them open. Only to discover that they were facing a solid wall. It was a sight that made Jan's heart sink. I was concerned about my wife, my children, that I'm going to see him again. 
I decided I was going to look up at the top of the elevator and start trying to look for access panel of some sort. It's it's locked. Not doors. There is no panel at the top of this elevator. No apparent escape from the top. And all this time, more smoke is coming in, and more smoke is getting a little denser every minute as it passes by. It was less than five minutes before the second plane would strike. And Brian Clark continued to check on his employees. I walked up toward the north wall, where a number of people were standing looking at the north tower, and I had heard that people were jumping from the north tower. I refused personally to go to the glass and see that. I just didn't want that image in my memory bank. But one of the people that was against the glass, she ran back to me in tears. I said, Susan, I know it's a terrible thing, it's a tragedy. And I walked her toward the west side of the building. And I can actually credit that event, that interaction with Susan, with saving my life. I'll go back to my office, sir. At that moment, Stanley was returning to his office on the 81st floor, unaware how the unfolding disaster was about to impact him, literally. I walk back to my office and the phone is ringing. It's a phone call from Chicago. A young lady is calling me to find out, Stan, are you okay? And I'm telling her, look, I'm fine, everything is well. And for no apparent reason, I just raise my head and I'm watching to the Statue of Liberty. And there I saw the biggest plane that I've ever seen coming straight towards me. after being told that the South Tower was in no danger, Stanley Premuth was back in his office on the 81st floor in the direct path of the second hijacked plane. Stanley cowered beneath his desk. Three floors above, Brian Clark's office was coming apart. The room just fell apart. It was as if somebody had uh, ripped open some concrete sacks and just waved them in the air. It was just white dust everywhere. And what was amazing was that it, it happened in a second. But the terror was just beginning. The building just started to move. It swayed to the west. It just kept going. I don't know how far it swayed. For 10 seconds, it just seemed to go one way. I thought we were going over. And then I sort of sobered up. I clicked my flashlight on that I'd had from 15 minutes earlier, and I sort of rallied the troops. Everybody out! Point your head! We went down the hallway. We came to a crossroads. And from that center crossroads, Five yards to my right was stairway C. Five yards ahead of me was stairway B. Five yards to my left was stairway A. I don't know why, I turned left and began to descend stairway A. We entered the stairs right on the 84th floor and went fairly quickly down three floors to the 81st floor. As we approached the landing, coming up from the 80th floor was a woman with her hands up. Stop, stop. No. You can't go down. Don't go down there. We got to We've got to get above the flames and the smoke. And she just kept talking. And our group fell into a, quite a debate as to whether we should go up or down. Inside his office, Stanley was trapped under his desk, just yards away from where the plane had come to rest. The plane stuck the bottom wing is stuck in my office door 20 feet from where my desk was. With the impact, I was temporarily deaf, and I couldn't breathe. I was cut, I was bloodied, I was bruised. The plain wing that was wedged in the door started to burn, and my greatest fear was this was going to ignite the fuel, and I was going to die. So I started to crawl on top of this rubble. 
I called the entire length of the loans department. To the computer room. And I ended up in the communication room. There was nobody to help me. And I'm crying like a baby. Lord, please don't leave me to die. Send somebody, anybody to save me. Help me! Help me! Help me! Help me! Inside the elevator in Tower One, the smoke was getting thicker and the men knew that unless they acted quickly, they faced almost certain asphyxiation. And then... This is drywall. Drywall. Recognize this is drywall. I'm not going to have a problem break this because I have experience, I work with drywall and it is too easy to break. The wall didn't even budge. We were obviously not dealing with a, a standard sheetrock wall. But whatever it was, it was their only way out. You have life, anybody oh, no, have yeah. Yeah. Life? life? Everybody started looking up in the pocket as they don't have anything sharp. Then, I was worried. Luckily, Jan had brought his squeegee with him. Now, it was their only hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's good, that's good, that'll work. Um, the smoke was the whole time growing up. The smell was very, very strong and was getting stronger by the minute. It was the smell <coughs> in the elevator that was beginning to get to everybody. As the smoke and jet fuel continued to filter into the cramped space, the men took turns digging through a second and then a third layer of drywall. I couldn't believe that we were dealing with a drywall that was uh, close to two inches thick. It's not doing it. Oh, you got it, you got it, you got it. After chipping away at this wall, for, I'd say 20, 30 minutes, we finally got the hole through and this fresh air started coming through and we noticed the air clearing. Breathe, breathe, breathe from the hole. Everybody felt quite relieved now. It's, it's a big weight off your mind knowing that you're not going to suffocate from smoke inhalation. Feels good. But their relief was short lived as Jan finally peered into the hole. I don't see anything. No light, no nothing. That was dark. Another wall there. There's another wall? Another wall on the other side. The situation had gone from hopeful to hopeless. And it was about to go from bad to worse. I don't know. I don't hold it properly or my hand was tired or something, but the blade slipped down to the shaft. As Jan grappled with what to do next, Back in stairwell A, the argument about which way to proceed continued. And in the midst of this debate, I heard this voice and this knocking, tap, 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 help, I'm buried. And I stopped listening to the debate and uh, I heard it again. Come on, somebody's in here. I said, come on, Ron, we've got to get this guy. Come on. Ryan and his colleague, Ron DeFrancesco, followed the mysterious voice into the smoke. Hey! Is anybody in here? My flashlight was like a high beam headlight on a country road in a foggy night. All I could see was this beam of light. But I was breathing normally, and it was as if I was in a bubble. Ron was overcome with smoke, and he was struggling as he walked along with me. <coughs> Keeping his flashlight trained on the sound of the voice, Brian continued into the remains of the 81st floor. So we can hear you. Help me! It's coming from in here. As we got close to the voice, we still couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden, right in front of me, a hand had appeared, waving frantically. 
and through this place where he'd stuck his hand out, I could see his eyes looking back at me. I can't get out of here. The smoke is killing me. Come on. At that time, Ron crouched down, and I could see him back off the floor, and he disappeared to the stairs, and I didn't know where he'd gone. What's your name? I'm Brian. Look, we're going to get you out of here. But Brian soon realized that getting the man out was not going to be easy. He was in an airspace that he was just trapped in, almost like a closet that he couldn't get out of. And I started removing debris, and we got to this last object, and we couldn't move it. It was somehow lodged there, and the only way out was up and over. And as I'm trying to climb, I couldn't make it. And I started to pray. I says, Lord, just this one time more, give me the strength. And after that prayer, I felt strong, and I started to jump and grab. And Brian grabbed my hand. And I lifted him out over this barrier. I'm not a particularly strong person, but up and over he came and we fell in a heap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I give this man the biggest hug and kiss and I says, you are my guardian angel. And he said, we'll be brothers for life. And, and it was just a great feeling. But there was no time to save their instant bond. <laughs> I said, but Brian, we've got to go. We've got to run. This building is going. I don't know what going meant, but in my heart, that's the only word that came. This building is going. We've got to get out from here. It's three inch, I did not think it's three pieces. Just as he was making good progress digging through the wall that blocked their escape, Jan Damchor lost his grip, and his squeegee fell into the shaft. I was almost have a tear in my eyes. But one man behind me saw what happened. He grabbed the handle and started scratching. Continue. Here it is 40 minutes after the first plane hit our building. We still hadn't known what had happened. I mean, all we know is that there's a fire in the building. Of course, it's a fire. We had smoke in the elevator. Not knowing when the fire might reach them, the men did the only thing they could. They kept digging. And it occurred to me that if you see people cut drywall, they basically score it and snap it. Score it. Scrape, scrape a line across so it, it weakens it. Yeah, yeah. So if we could score this thing, we had a good chance of busting through it. That's it, that's it. Hey, yeah, there you go. Nice big strokes. We were scratching downward, etching a line into the sheetrock, anything to weaken this wall. Maybe not even kick it. We all started taking turns kicking at the wall, and I said, let me try kicking it another way. I turned my back to the wall. Yeah, right there. Like a sort of a horse kick. My foot went through. And now we had a bigger hole. And as we kicked it, we could see that it budged. And uh, we could hear tiles falling on the other side. Something fell out from this other hole. If it's tiles, that's that's not bad. That's good. That's yeah. After nearly 45 minutes trapped inside the elevator, the men finally saw light at the end of the tunnel. It's a men's room. We're okay. It's a sink. It's a bathroom. It's a men's room. So I said, listen, make this a little larger. I'm the slimmest of you guys. I think I can go through and perhaps get help. With the help of the other men, yeah. Alfred was able to squeeze through the hole into the bathroom. Please, please, please. There you go. Oh. 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 You guys, listen to me. Come on, I'm going to get help. Be right back. Hey. 
the smoke now was more intense and the funny smell of uh, chemicals was burning was much more heavy. By now, Michael Hinkson had nearly reached the same level as the men in the elevator. But it was slow going. I was going as fast as I felt safe to go. If people wanted to go faster than me, the stairs were wide enough for them to pass us. As they continued their way down, Michael heard voices from above asking them to move to the side. Stand aside! Our victims coming through! We knew that there was fire above us, so it wasn't surprising that there would be some burn victims. You couldn't touch them, so there were people who were surrounding them, making sure that they didn't come in contact with anything. So everyone worked together. It was a, it was a collective team effort as we were going down the stairs. For Brian and Stanley, the stairwell in Tower Two was becoming hard to negotiate. The first few floors were difficult. There was a lot of drywall that had been blown off the walls. So using the handrail, we were able to get down a couple of awkward floors like that. Ready to go. 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 Ah, watch your knee there. Watch your leg. The two men had reached the direct impact zone. But miraculously, the stairwell was not impassable as the woman had reported. By now, Alfred had descended two floors in his search for help. Right away, nothing more said. The fireman came back with me. We go back up to the floor that I just exited from. Great. Are you sure everybody can walk? Everybody can walk. Just as the last fellow came through the hole in the wall, the mailroom fellow came back with a fireman. Let's go, everybody out here. Everybody out the exit. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And this fireman had this astonished look on his face like, what are these people doing here? The fireman then took us to the stairwell where they was evacuating the building, bringing people down by the hundreds. So in the melee, we got disbanded again from each other. Not knowing if he would ever see his companions again, Alfred made his way down the stairwell. There was no lights. Totally darkness. Totally blackness. Meanwhile, Michael Hinkson and his guide dog, Roselle, had been slowly descending the stairs for over an hour. But it was the men climbing up the stairs who made an indelible impression. As they would come up, they would ask everyone if they needed assistance. They asked me if anyone was with me. They were the real heroes of the day. All they said was they were going up to fight whatever fire and whatever was going on up the stairs and they didn't know what all they were going to run into. It was just minutes before the first tower would fall. Just minutes before their tower would collapse, Brian and Stanley were still making their way down the deserted staircase. It was very strange that nobody was walking up, no firemen, no police. We didn't overtake any other evacuees. It wasn't until they reached the plaza level that they finally encountered a group of rescue workers. And the cops and the firefighters and EMS workers were cheering us along. Run, 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 go to liberty. Is that safe? I want you to cross with me, keep your eyes down because there's fine to breathe. You understand? Yes, yes. Thank you. Warned of the danger, Brian and Stanley prepared to cross the street. I said, Stanley, are you ready? He says, yep. I said, let's go. And we started to run. Not even one piece of broken glass touched us, nothing. We ended up at the back side of Trinity Church, and uh, it was at that time that Stanley broke down. I think you were saving my life. Thank you. I think you saved mine. I said, well, Stanley, I think you maybe saved my life, too, because you got me out of that debate up there, whether to go up or go down, up on the 84th floor. Back inside tower number one, Michael and Roselle continued down the last few flights of stairs. We're on the 12th floor. We're almost there. Keep going. And when they finally exited the building, the situation was worse than they'd imagined. 
got outside, David looked back and said, my God, both buildings are on fire. At that point, we were really left to our own devices, except we were told to get away from the World Trade Center complex. As Michael and Roselle retreated from tower number one, Ryan and Stanley stood transfixed by the sight of the towers from which they'd just escaped. Staring up at the towers, Stanley said, you know, I think that tower could come down. And I said, there's no way. That's a steel structure. I reached in my pocket, took out a business card, and I pushed it in his hand, and I said, Brian, if I don't see you again, we would meet up in heaven. He didn't finish the sentence when boom, boom, we heard some explosions. And looking up at the top of the tower, it started to slide down. And I remember seeing sparkles all up in the air at that great height. And it was glass breaking as the floor started to compress. The windows were popping out and catching the sunlight. George Phoenix was still inside tower number one as the neighboring tower gave way. I can remember getting to somewhere on the 16th floor. You know, I, I kind of felt like, wow, I'm going to make it out of here. Everything, everything's uh, going to be okay. And no sooner that thought that, we heard this heavy rumbling. We started to hear this incredible metallic sounding roar. They kept getting louder and louder. And instantly, we were covered in dust. We were breathing as much dust as we were air. It got to this point where you could literally not see your hand in front of your face. And it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Suddenly, over the church came this tsunami of white dust, gray dust, and debris. And we started to run. People started to scream. It looked like a scene from a war movie. We were shoulder to shoulder, and then suddenly, he wasn't there. And I stopped, I looked a little bit left and right, and I yelled, no response. Stanley had just disappeared in the blink of an eye. And I thought that was strange. And then I had this feeling wash over me that oh, Stanley's not real. He's an angel. He was sent to save me. And, and it was the strangest feeling. Stanley! And then I remembered the business card. And I dove into my pocket and I pulled it out. And it was there. And I knew that Stanley was real. But the reality of the situation was just beginning to dawn on George and Jan as they reached the lobby level. Keep going, keep it moving. I don't know where I am. I go down my knees and I look left and I just take my, because so much dust in my eyes from powder, gray powder like snow. Are you all right? You see that exit sign? Yeah. You gotta go that way, sir. You gotta keep it moving. Yeah. Keep it moving. Move towards an exit. Flashlights were almost useless because of all the dust in the air. But one fireman said, "Come this way. There's a way out this way." Everybody back here. Keep it moving. They let us out, out the building, and we walked along the side of the building on rubble. I heard someone say Tower 2 had collapsed, but I dismissed it. It was, it sounds like, that's absurd. And then I heard someone else mention it. At that point, I didn't know what to think. I, I, I could think of, well, gee, if that tower can come down, certainly my tower could come down also. No sooner had the thought entered George's mind than he heard the horrible rumbling again. When they start falling, I just please God, help, help these people. I know somebody's there, maybe so many people there. But no answer, no help. The collapse 
of the World Trade Towers left Michael Hinkson emotionally and physically drained. But even in his fragile condition, he was acutely aware that his life had been touched by a miracle. When we were running, people were screaming, I can't see. Roselle seemed not to have any problem seeing. I think that was God's hand and maybe the miracle of the, of the day for all of us. She never once lost her focus and her job, and we were both able to function together effectively. And I thought that that was a, a pretty remarkable thing. Jan Damchor was still in shock as he made his way out of the area. My body started shaking and my head was so pain. What's your name? And I recognized this guy who was with me in the elevator. Yeah. From the elevator. <laughs> she made it. Oh. Knowing that they would never have survived without each other's help, George and Jan could not hold back their emotions. So when George met me on the street and we get a hawk, this is the greatest hawk in my life. We were fortunate enough to have Jan there with his tools. Without those things, who knows? Another 30 seconds either way. Yeah. This wouldn't be a miracle. On that same day, September 11, look at all the people that was not trapped. All they had to do was just walk, and they didn't make it. But yeah, we are trapped on the elevator. Now, had a squeegee, which was the only thing that is going to help save our lives. And he made it just in time to get on before the door closed. I can't find nothing else that's more closer to America than that. In the aftermath of September 11th, the search for meaning and for closure continues. The events of that day weigh heavily on the entire world but most profoundly on the men and women who found themselves in harm's way. It's their personal experiences in the face of overwhelming disaster that may lead the rest of us to a deeper understanding and respect for life. I think everybody's life has changed. Mine certainly has. Everyone is going to have to decide to come closer together and work closer together to make sure that that doesn't happen again. If we don't learn that from what happened on September 11th, we will not be doing justice to, nor will we be honoring the memory of all those incredible firemen who went up those stairs, and all those people who didn't make it out of the buildings, and the people who died on the airplanes that day. True to their word, on that fateful day in September, Stanley and Brian have remained as close as brothers and continue to marvel at the miracle that brought them together. I knew God saved me on that particular day. I saw that plane coming towards me, and for some divine reason, the plane made a little tilt and a turn. I don't understand the logic where the 79th floor would go and impact, the 88th floor would go and impact. I'm from the 81st floor was saved, and the people from the 82nd floor was gone. I would never know the answer why, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's a miracle. It was miraculous that the two of us came together. I was in a loud argument on the stairwell, and yet I heard Stanley's voice from some distance away, through walls, through doors. There were only four people that survived from above the impact. I don't believe I saved Stanley. There was greater forces at work that saved Stanley that day and saved me. There are no stories of anybody descending or surviving a descent of stairway C or stairway B. Stairway A, there are a number of survivors. So that was a small miracle. The summation of everything borders on miraculous. Because I, I don't like to use miracle too loosely. The fact that a number of things happened that were small M miraculous, maybe together 
make one capital M miracle. For Jan, George, and Alfred, the miracle of their escape will never be forgotten, and neither will the kinship that a group of complete strangers found in each other. There's definitely a bond between myself and the other fellas. Remember what we went through in the elevator and everybody's working together to get out. It's something we'll never forget. We've shared something so dramatic together. It's always nice to see them. Uh, and I truly hope in the future that we see each other more and that we don't just like drift apart. <laughs> but along with the comfort of their special bond comes a great sadness each time they look at the site where the towers once stood. In the beginning, I not try to look because from my street, look left, there was twin towers. Now, when I look, stomach goes up and you get angry and you get depression. It's not the same picture. No, that's the no. one. I used to look out the window and see the Empire State Building right across the way. Ah, there was a beautiful view. But uh, it's a miracle I'm survived. And I don't know how long I live, but I'm happy I'm alive. You have to make a future for yourself, for your children. You have to live some way. You have to go on. That's our show. I want to thank everyone who shared their remarkable stories with us. While the miracles of 9-11 can never make up for the immense and needless loss of life that occurred that day, we hope the stories that you've just seen will stand as a testament to the courage and compassion of the men and women caught in this unjustifiable attack. It's to them, the victims both living and dead, that we dedicate this show. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Goodbye.